All right, well, it is time to get started. Welcome everyone. It's Wednesday and it's noon, so it's time for our One Schoolhouse webinar. I'm Sarah <laughs> Hannawald, Assistant Head of School here at One Schoolhouse for, for, for Professional Development and New Programs. And I have two guests with me today, one of whom is well known to those who are watching <laughs> our webinars or attending live. So I want to welcome Peter Galligan. And the other guest is new to this audience, Phyllis Gimbel, Dr. Phyllis Gimbel, who we are delighted to have here with us today. Dr. Gimbel is professional professor of educational leadership at Bridgewater State University. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask her to introduce herself. So I'm just going to welcome everybody as we do with a little update about what's going on here at One Schoolhouse. I'll share my screen. Today, we're going to talk about leadership and mentoring and um, talk about a book that I'm going to show you in just a minute. On our blog, we have a post written that was inspired by this book by me about mentoring and a special form of mentoring that's I've called it peership. I didn't make it up, but um, it's a fun word. Next week, we're going to talk about resilience in school adults. And Leslie Fry will be back with me for that. Call for teachers. If you have been thinking about teaching online and expanding your skill set and your repertoire, please consider applying to teach here at One Schoolhouse. We are actively recruiting now for a number of positions and would love to talk with you. And in other exciting news, we have released our 22-23 student course catalog and registration is open and has already begun. So it's exciting to see students and their um, faculty advisors start thinking about next year. Every week we ask a question and the question this week was, how do you describe the most important professional connections? And Phyllis and Peter, I gave you a sneak peek on this already, but the results are really interesting because they say, well, it they kind of say it depends, don't they? And we're going to talk about these more in a little bit, but I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll come back and share again. And I want to remind everybody, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A. And then I'm going to stop sharing and ask Phyllis and Peter just to introduce themselves very briefly to everybody before we get going. Shall I go first then? Yes, please do. Okay. Well, I'm Phyllis. Hello, everyone from Massachusetts is where I'm located. And I actually met Peter in 1984, teaching with him at Beaver Country Day School. And we've maintained our friendship ever since. In fact, our paths recrossed when my own daughter became an assistant head of school here at Dedham Country Day School, where Peter's uh, wife was also a teacher for many years. And then we reconnected in many other avenues. So I have taught educational leadership. I've taught in independent schools, as well as public schools. And mentoring really became very important to me in my experience, because I never really had a professional mentor and I realized I really needed one. So I will stop at that now till Sarah asks more questions and let Peter speak. Well, Phyllis has done a good job introducing me. Uh, I've been <laughs> around this <clears throat> world of uh, in education uh, all in independent schools for quite a long time. And I've had a chance to be an academic leader. Uh, also, like Phyllis, uh, had no formal mentoring anywhere along the line. Uh, had the opportunity to set up some mentorship programs for new teachers at uh, a school where I worked. And uh, I just very excited when Philip was, Phyllis was talking about this project and uh, uh, said, was I interested in in contributing. Yes, please. So thank you, Phyllis. And thank you, Sarah, for having us. Absolutely. And I will just tell everybody, we've had kind of some fun because uh, PG are both of your <laughs> initials. So as we were working through who's going to do what, like some of my abbreviations and shorthands didn't work as well as they usually do. So I just want to tell everybody, so the book is Leadership Through Mentoring. Um, it is uh, easy to tackle, I think, in the sense that it's, it's not too too thick, but there's a lot to think about. And you can see from my copy already that it opens to certain sections. So if you if you start, I promise you, you will learn a lot and we will dive in and I can't recommend it enough. So 
having said that, let's start off really talking about the book and why this book. So Phyllis, do you want to start? Like, why sure. this book? Sure. Well, as a, a leader in many different avenues, both in independent schools, public schools, and kind of in a university setting where I'm teaching educational leadership, and my actually my doctoral degree is in educational leadership, I realized how important it is to have someone with whom you can bounce things off, how, someone with whom you can share successes and challenges, someone with whom you can confide, especially in today's world where we are overwhelmed, all of us, teachers and administrators, with all that's going on academically, professionally, socially, and emotionally. So this book, I thought, could serve as a guide to explain the value and the importance of mentoring in general, even in nonprofit organizations other than school institutions, as well as maybe a guidebook for people who would like to start having mentoring programs. And the excitement for me was seeing that uh, two New England states have very established principal mentorship programs. Uh, and these are well-established, well-articulated. Uh, they think long and hard, and the book spells out the details of how mentors get selected, how mentors get into what the relationship could look like. And I realized from my own experience that this is universally applicable, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be two people in the same school. As for a new teacher at your school, that makes a lot of sense to have it be in the school. But... Uh, just the opportunity and the the urgency of creating this. One of the issues that uh, the book raises is that of uh, um, how long people last in some of these jobs. And we know that administrative leadership, uh, we know that stability there is important. And right now there isn't a whole lot of that in a great many schools and a great many sectors. Yes, that's super important and certainly, you know, a topic of an article every time you sort of jump into media or open a paper. So, Sienna, you asked kind of, and correct me if I am not correct, kind of why I wrote, we or I together, we wrote this book. May I add to that? Yes, absolutely. I tell you that research has shown that believe it or not, school leaders are the second most important impact on student achievement after teachers. So that actually compelled me after doing that research to realizing, wow, it's not just the teachers, it's the leadership in the school itself. Whether it's a head, assistant head, an academic dean, a middle school head, whatever, those people impact teaching and learning student achievement in their schools. So that, that was important to me. Yeah, all right. So I'm gonna leave our organized track here. I wanna follow up on that a little bit because we know that teachers are the most important relationship that students have as learners. Is there any data to support the idea that teachers are more likely to stay and thrive when there's stability in the, role, in the leadership role? Yes. There is some data, but one of the questions you posed when we were discussing this and ha about having uh, our webinar today basically was that question. And what it is, is that mentoring in the different states that now have initiated it with public schools, that is Vermont and Massachusetts and New Hampshire for that matter, where it's mandated and it's being initiated and implemented by the various departments of education for public schools in these states, they're trying to reduce teacher turnover mm -hmm. having mentoring programs. So in essence, the answer to your question is forthcoming. They have not had it long enough to be able to provide actual data. And then unfortunately, this is year number two and a half with COVID, therefore, it changes absolutely everything. So the, I guess the answer to your question is our outcome and the one of the rationales for having mentoring programs is twofold. I know that's one of your questions. One being 
can we reduce academic leadership attrition? Right. Two, can we, re and this one is kind of a hidden one, but in a survey would surely be asked, can we reduce the stress of academic leaders so that we keep leadership in the schools for more than two or three years, because oftentimes we find school leaders are gone mm -hmm. after three years. And this is not good because of two reasons. One, teacher turnover. Two, student achievement. And three, very important, culture, school culture. Yes. And um, I want to talk a little bit more about culture, too, as we go. But Peter, you mentioned that um, not having a mentor was one of the reasons that you wanted to write this book. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, I can remember going to a workshop years and years ago uh, led by Steve Clem, uh, who was oh. doing a lot of work on uh, sort of teacher support. And one of the things that he mentioned as sort of a lead off was that as a teacher, as a new teacher, his feeling of efficacy, you know, with the, you know, we all know how hard as a new teacher it is to learn the craft and trade. Uh, and he wondered aloud to all of us if he had had great mentoring guidance early on in that career, how much more effective would he be as, as a teacher? And Steve put it in terms of the experience of students. And then I think, oh, yeah, the students I had in my first few years of teaching, boy, I could have done better for them. And so that has stayed with me forever as a, it's kind of a, a, a little anthem that plays in my head about the whole idea of preparing teachers and uh, then preparing administrators. Because when I was an academic dean, I was a brand new academic dean. I had to look all over the place. Fortunately, mm -hmm. I found, uh, we'll talk about this perhaps later, uh, I, I found a community through a listserv of other people who were in the same boat I was trying to do the same kinds of things, having been charged with the same kind of work. And we sort of cried on each other's shoulders and gave one another advice as uh, the years went on. And uh, that was a great support for me. And I hope I was a better academic dean because of that. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Sarah, go ahead. I would know I have a question for you, Phyllis, which was you talked a little bit about the value of scenario planning. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. Scenario planning, meaning uh, the you meet, talked about the writing meet, scenarios oh by someone who's not necessarily affiliated with one school and the oh, value that the mentees found. Oh, right, right. That's a that's a good point. Well, since I am a professor now in my <laughs> later career after teaching and administering in schools, I did the study and in the study in both from Massachusetts, one of the study participants, and I'm going to quote that, that uh, person right now said, you have to have a trusted mentor or someone else that's across town that you can call that can understand the shoes you're walking in. To me, that says it all because You've got to vent sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you even want to brag about a success, especially if you're in your first few years when you're trying to lay groundwork and hope if you really are enjoying your position that indeed these good things that are happening, these actions and behaviors that are remunerated by a healthy culture and teacher collegiality and administrator teacher collegiality are working well you have a very good chance of continuing in your position, if indeed, of course, you want to. So I think that says it all, especially in our troubling times today, just to have someone to call who has been an administrator of sorts, maybe not exactly 110% your position, mm -hmm. but at least, uh, for example, once I was a department chair, I was only a chair of nine people. However, the same kinds of things occurred as when I was head of a school. 
Right. So there, there are parallels and sometimes there's scale and sometimes it's, there's nuance, right? But there, but there's some threads that will seem to go through that. Exactly. And, and well-trained mentors, even if they haven't had the exact experience that their mentee may be worrying about or concerned about, they can reflect and draw on their experiences and their own perspectives in the past to offer advice even on novel situations. And as Phil has said, we're all living in a situation now where every day, every minute is not in uh, ways that we <laughs> yes. wish weren't the case. Be careful or I'm gonna wax on about adaptive expertise. And I know everybody's heard me do that before. Um, well, Phyllis, let's think about what an academic leader who's reading this book, what can they learn as they're reading that book? Well, number one, hopefully they will be more open to sharing successes and challenges and not worry about, for example, being evaluated or goals of evaluation, but rather being able to improve and increase the culture. I do think this boils down seriously to, it makes me think of my second book written actually with an independent school head. I'd be happy to mention her name, Lanisa Liana from the Belmont Day School here in Belmont, Massachusetts. She and I collaborated on the second book, Healthy Culture, mm. the, the Key to Improving Schools. And so relevant to your question, the school head or the administrator, the dean, whatever the administration is, really needs time to build relationships and connections with teachers especially nowadays when teachers' heads are swirling with so much. I, I read somewhere, and this is what I was going to tell you very much in the end, but it's pertinent now, that administrators are sitting in a complaint window. I think that little, um, I don't know what you call it, analogy or, what, or metaphor is absolutely lovely because the administrators are listening to all the complaints of the teachers and their heads are swirling and swirling. So we need to lighten, we as administrators need to lighten the load for the teachers in some way so that they can build connections with us and with their students so that learning can take place and improve within that institution. So I hope I kind of answered your question. <laughs> Well, no, I really like that. And I think there are a couple of things that you touched on that I just want to reemphasize. One is that the get, getting over the fear of looking imperfect, right? Like that's, you just got to let that go, right? And so that allowing that vulnerability to make the professional connections that you have and the culture more authentic, it sounds like, is, is one of the key things that happens through our mentoring program. Exactly that. Exactly that. And Peter has referred to programs here in Massachusetts and Vermont where the associations of administrators, this is for public schools, all right, have taken it upon themselves to do training programs for mentors. So pertinent to some of the things that you've asked, Sarah, who are these people that want to be mentors or that offer to be mentors or are chosen to be mentors? Are they trained? How? Do they need to be trained? And in what way, what kind of training could they possibly have? And the answer, I guess, well, I have facilitated these programs, but the key component that I've seen, and by the way, incidentally, these public school uh, associations, the Mass School Administrators Association, for example, and the Vermont Principals Association, another example, they have special training programs, which we've developed together, where we kind of take these very experienced people who are either retired school heads or other administrators who actually, believe it or not, pre-COVID, had a little bit of time and wanted to devote some of that little bit of time to meet with new school leaders and impart their knowledge. How, what kind of training could they have? Key to that is, Peter has mentioned this, not being a clone of your mentee or protege because the context of every single school is just so different. 
the composition of the student body, the staff. And when I talk about staff, that is not teachers. Mm -hmm. Other folks who inhabit that building, who impact the school culture in every way, and the teachers themselves. So we need to train whoever is going to be a mentor in listening and really understanding the context of that school. And you had asked me prior to our little um, get together today, are regular meetings important? In my mind and in the book, we say yes. Mm -hmm. And we say yes, pursuant to your question, is because the longer you let things pile up, even if you're the best, best friend with someone, and this is not professional, you've got to spill it all out. So there you are with your new or somewhat new mentee, protege. And that person has so much to narrate because you haven't met either by phone or Zoom or FaceTime, an email, text, an app. You haven't had any modality of meeting. What is that mentor going to choose to talk about? What is the mentee going to choose to discuss and ask for help with? And how is that mentor ever going to really offer suggestions and advice if he or she hasn't kept up with the context of the school because, and doesn't know the culture because they haven't met or talked about it? So our book does say regular meetings time allotment is important. I once heard from a mentor that uh, this person who was in actually New York State and the mentee was in Vermont. The mentor could not travel due to weather to see the mentee, had met the mentee twice, but then decided we will have telephone, regular telephone meetings during the snow season. And it worked out for them. It worked out because they were regular. Mm -hmm. It was not like once a month. All right. So it sounds to me like you saw real value in, you know, everybody likes flexibility. Oh, we want to be flexible. We want to be responsive. But when you put some structure in place and some scaffolding and you don't, you don't make it in too rigid, but that everybody really benefits from that structure. And that's kind of a theme that I've heard um, as you've been talking and as I read the book. So true. There is a fellow uh, whom I'm actually studied with and knew very well named Roland Barth from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. B as in boy, A-R-T-H, Roland Barth. He used to work at the Principal Center, Peter's mm -hmm. name. Roland Barth communicated with me many times, oh gosh, at least 10 to 15 years ago. And one of the things uh, he used to say to me is, Phyllis, it's so important to get to know the school. Try to find a mentor, try hard. I couldn't at that time. And if you can't, just try to find anyone that you can sit and chat with and explain the context, the culture of your school, if you can do it. It's so important, the human connection. Right. So if you are making that effort to explain the culture of your school, that probably gives you insights as you make that explanation. I mean, that's, I know when I write a conference proposal, part of it is I know I'm going to learn by doing that presentation. So I'm going to put a little twist in here, and I want to know, what did you learn that surprised you? Were there any unexpected results or just something you didn't expect to find out along the way? Number one, back to Roland Barth, his book entitled Improving Schools from Within. I did not understand that in 1995. I do now. It took me all this time, and to answer your question, Sarah, the book and these studies my gracious, yes, these things from the outside. Yes, we have a board of trustees. Yes, we have school committees for public schools. And nice to hear what they have to say. Wonderful, we do need their perspective. Yes, we do, we value it. But until you're within, you really need to be within and explain to others what's going on and meet with them so they, and if possible, which would be most ideal, would be to have a mentor be able to walk through the school building and see what's going on and get a little grasp and feel mm -hmm. if the person has time. That would be the most ideal thing for that person to grasp the culture of the school. So what did I learn? I guess I learned about 
really, even though it's a book and a half ago, the importance of culture and teacher attrition, administrator attrition, and the value of a school leader, the impact on teaching and learning. I had no idea it would be that valuable. And then I guess, Sarah, given the COVID situation today and Omicron and the politics and everything else in the world, stress reduction, mental health stress. I have heard so many academic leaders and teachers saying that they really have got to do self-care. Well, to me, mentoring is part of self-care. If you've got someone you can call, a trusted confidant, who's not going to evaluate you, but can listen to you, my gosh, that's free therapy. <laughs> that's a great point. And I think... Um... I talk a little bit about that too in the post that I wrote, but Peter, what's, did you have any surprises? What surprised you? I think what surprised me was that A, these programs exist. Uh, that was exciting to learn about. Uh, and it was also just exciting to sort of delve into the research and, and see what had been done. Um, one of the things that I think is so important was that the, in setting up the mentorship programs, one of the things that has to happen is an unpacking of the nature of leadership. What are the elements of leadership? What are the most important aspects of leadership? How can these be learned or transferred? Uh, and how can you just talk about them? Because they seem so abstract uh, and they're either very abstract or they are so in the moment that you can't, you know, you can only see the tree that you're standing in front of instead of the forest. And it was just, I, I learned so much writing this book about that and about how school organizations in particular, these, uh, these state programs, uh, were facilitating a kind of leadership training that I was just jealous of. Peter is making me think, Sarah, but you also made me think, because you asked such wonderfully provocative questions, about the value, and I think you both have implied this, reflection. That is one of the things I've taught in the programs I have facilitated for prospective mentors. How do you reflect? And I think what you're saying, it's just so important to reflect, take a moment to reflect. I met a, uh, I'm gonna say a public school superintendent, not quite the same as a principal, who once said to me that one of the negatives of his position was he had no time to reflect. That really, boy, that really stuck with me. And that was a good 10, 12 years ago. And so it is important to reflect based on what you've said, uh, Sarah, because you just said that what did I learn out of this? And what I learned basically is you do need some time to reflect and understand your culture because then you can better act and behave and try to create connections with all those in that building. Everyone, staff included. Such a good point. And we've got a question in. I just want to remind everybody, we've got just a minute or so left. So I'm going to ask this question. If you have any other, please use the um, Q&A. But I'm going to take us back to our webinar opening slide when I share this question, which is how important is it that the mentor mentee have the same job or the exact same experience? And I think what we'll find from our poll responses is maybe, <laughs> maybe it's important, maybe it's not. And I'm really fascinated by this idea of different and same role being about half and half. Although we did talk, perhaps it is that the person doesn't have the same job now, but they used to have the job that you have. So we didn't, we don't have that there. I'm really interested in people who have a mentor where they've never worked. And Peter and I have a story about that because I was a newly minted academic dean when I just picked up the phone and called this really insightful academic dean who was posting on a listserv to ask questions. But um, what do you make of this particular chart, Phyllis, when you think about as experienced or more experienced, maybe? Well, it, it's going to be a strange response that I have. I could parallel that with friendship. 
There are some friends I have with whom I can share most anything, personal sadnesses and joys. And other friends, frankly, I like them very much. I enjoy their company, but I am not going to share. So in my mind, based on what you've just said and what you show on your slide, I think it depends on who the mentor is. If the mentor has walked in your shoes, but is not a great listener, has no empathy, cannot uh, really advise and suggest and understand the context, even though that person may have been a terrific school head, maybe that person can't be your best friend. Maybe you need the person who has had lesser experience in a very different situation, but has the other skills, the non-quantifiable skills. You know what you're really saying here, again, is that that slight structure and a little bit of oversight and the intention, you know, it's the intentionality behind the mentoring experience, both from the mentee and the mentor. I don't know if I think, I think that's a real word. <laughs> and when we have that intentionality, that's when the benefits really start to accrue. I think you're right. I think you're right. And, and you're, again, you're making me think, about friends, some friends who do want to sit and listen to you and the others who say, oh, let's get moving. Let's eat lunch. Right. <laughs> you know, you're right. All right. So we're out of time, but I'm just going to hold up the book one more time. <laughs> totally <laughs> recommend it. And I want to thank you both for being here today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. And all those who participated. Thank you. And Peter, thank you. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Phyllis. Thanks, everyone. This has been great. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Stay safe and be well. Ditto. <laughs>